We only teach you the pillars of Islam, and whether or not Islam happens to you, whether the happiness happens to you, that you end up in Islam, that Allah honors you with his honor of entering Islam, depends only on you. Why doesn't Allah manifest such a miracle so that everyone will believe? Because he is not a tyrant or a dictator to make everyone fear himself and convince them that he is the most important. Allah is the most loving, the most gentle. My God, in any language of the world, Allah can tell you things that he would not tell even the most advanced shape. Peace be upon you, dear friends. Today, our guest is Aydar Haydrutnov, PhD in philosophy, an Islamic scholar, translator, and author of books. And today, we will talk about the possibility for ordinary people to get religious knowledge. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. We have a question. How can an ordinary person get religious knowledge if he has such an interest? If a person is interested in religion, he can read books on Islam, for example. If that person is not a Muslim, if he is a Muslim, he has the opportunity to go to a Muslim school where he can learn about religion. But the question here is that knowledge about religion, you still have to discover what it is. It is one thing to know Islam and another thing to be in Islam. Even the expression, knowing Islam, is wrong. To know about Islam, this is how Islamic scholars know. For example, in scientific Islamic studies, in Western Islamic studies, they know Islam sometimes even better than Muslims themselves, but they're not in Islam. There are also cases when Muslims who have received excellent religious education and diplomas also know about Islam and even practice, but they are not in Islam. This is a paradox that happens because they don't know how to distinguish. They don't teach to distinguish that Islam is this and knowledge about Islam is something else. For example, take the simplest well-known hadith that Islam rests on five pillars. Namaz, Uraza, Zakat, Hajj, and so on. No one thinks that Islam rests on these five pillars. And when a person fulfills all of these five pillars, that is, he accepts faith in Allah, declares it, begins to read Namaz, and perform other rituals that are considered obligatory, he already believes that he is in Islam. But the Hadith says that Islam is only based on these pillars. I've written about this before. For example, when a man builds a house, the house must stand on a foundation. These five pillars are like a foundation, but no one lives in a foundation. So people who think they are teaching Islam would have to tell their students that we only teach you the pillars of Islam, and whether or not Islam happens to you, whether the happiness happens to you, that you end up in Islam, that Allah honors you with his honor of entering Islam, depends only on you, on the degree of your sincerity, devotion, your zeal, readiness to sacrifice that which is customary in order to find this Islam. Because in the Quran, Allah says that He expands the chest for Islam. If a person thinks that he is in Islam because he performs rituals, that is not really true. It's simply called being Muslim, from the verb to obey. A Muslim is a person who obeys, accepts these rules here, gets a chance to reach heaven, so to speak, by doing all this. In principle, even of these five pillars, it is possible to perform under certain conditions. Of course, it is desirable to perform all of them. 
But sometimes there are such conditions that a person can, well, that's life, only do shahada, that is, a confession of faith in Allah, and namaz, for Uraza, for example, he is not healthy, he cannot afford it. Even these two are enough so that maybe Allah will notice this person, his diligence, and then will expand his chest for Islam like this. In Muslim educational institutions, I believe, when recruiting applicants, they should announce to them that we will teach you only the pillars of Islam, the basics of Islam, the first steps. That is, we will teach you to read namaz correctly. We will teach you to read the Quran correctly. We will teach you the Arabic language. Let's say we will teach you all the rituals that are obligatory and that are desirable, the Sunnah and so on. But we cannot give you Islam. This is what we have to say. That is, a person must be correctly oriented at once so that he knows what he's learning. Otherwise, it turns out that a person leaves a madrasa with a diploma and everyone considers him an adherent of Islam who lives in Islam. I have seen one imam who must have a diploma. He must have many followers, and he says that people who translate the Qur'an must be killed. This is our contemporary. I have a question. This Imam, who looks good in appearance, and if you live with him, you can probably be sure that he does everything, all the namazes, not only fars and sunnah, but also additional ones. Maybe he does not sleep nights and leads worship. In general, there is nothing to complain about in terms of how to be a Muslim, whether he is a right Muslim or not. But what happens inside a man if he says we should kill those who bring the word of Allah in a language they understand to those people who don't know Arabic? They should be killed. What is that? Where did he get that from? This man must have a religious degree if he is an Imam. Where did he read that people who bring the word of Allah in an intelligible language to people who do not know Arabic must be killed? Did he read it in the Quran or the Sunnah? The man is pumped, full of religious knowledge, and it just oozes out of him. Ask him any question, he will offer you a thousand answers, won't he? Yes, that's the way it is. And in the end, kill. Or take the story of the shooting in Bamiyan province in Afghanistan. Many people probably remember. The Taliban used guns to shoot up ancient monuments, statues of Buddha. And they didn't do it on their own, that they wanted to shoot. In Afghanistan, Islam has been around for many, many centuries. Those statues were there, and the Muslims were still there, and no one had a hand in it. And why could they not do it for a thousand years, more than a thousand years, and now they just decided to shoot them? Who gave this instruction? Who issued this fatwa? The mullahs. They have mullahs, and those mullahs issued a fatwa. I have a question. I did not receive religious education, but I know that in the Quran, Allah says that you must not desecrate someone else's holy places, because those for whom they're sacred will burn with hatred of Islam. Have these mullahs read this or not? Are they mullahs? Or is there only one L in the word? Who are they anyway? They lead people for themselves. And the whole world looks at these Muslims. The Taliban are such sincere Muslims, loyal, but they're looked at as savages. That is all. And does this increase the authority of Islam? I had such a story. That's basically where I should have started, but... I had such a prelude. One day, I was speaking at a meeting somewhere. There were a lot of young people there. I was invited there. There was a presentation of my book. I don't know if it was something about the Quran. And when the questions started, there was a complaint against me. Don't you know that only Saeeds have the right to interpret the Quran's ayats? The Saeeds, if anyone doesn't know, are the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. This girl stated to me, only the Saeeds. 
Which begs the question, does Allah say in the Quran that this book should only be in the hands of the Sayyids and only the Sayyids should tell people about it? Or does Allah in the Quran speak to all people? To all people? To all people? Where did this girl get this dogma that only Sayyids and if you're not a Sayyid, and you dare, you're going to hell. This is what she told me. There is a hadith that says that he who understands the Quran in his own way will go to hell. I very much doubt that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, could have said such things. Sometimes people just lack a little, how should I say it, awareness, enough to listen to themselves from the outside. What are you talking about? Like the Imam who says that we should kill those who translate the Quran, or this girl who says that only Sayyids are allowed. Where is all this coming from? My God, this is actually religious education. The girl in the hijab, the great prophet of Allah, Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said that the death as a tutor is enough. How should we understand that? No word of Allah in the form of scripture may reach a person. No word of Allah in the form of a heritage that is transmitted through the prophets in the form of hadith, say. Not necessarily the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad, but the previous prophets. A man can live his whole life somewhere in the wild mountains, they still exist. For example, there are such jungles where the so-called non-contact tribes live. Non-contact tribes. They know nothing about Allah, but they all know that they are dying. So it follows from this hadith that if a person reflects on such a phenomenon as death, which is sure to wait him, if he observes this process, if he immerses himself in it, his consciousness will realign in such a way that he begins to see the truth, that there is a power that gives in this life, that this power supports his life, and not only his life, but the life of everything around, and the existence of everything around, that which he considers both living and non-living. Thus, without any scripture, a man can comprehend the truth and realize that if everyone dies and I die, I should probably have time to find that which does not die. And if he finds it, it will be called Salat. Salat is a connection with Allah, an inner spiritual connection. That is, a person will become centered in himself. Not that he will return to the center, but the center of man, which we call spirit, which Allah has blown into every man. When man realizes that he is this eternal spirit, this is a moment when he finds that which does not die, and then he can say in death face, Death, where is your sting? What can you do to me now? I know I'm not dying. Why are we here today? I have to admit, this is my initiative. Many times I have heard this. This is a serious question. This is a methodological question. Many times I have heard that if a person does not have religious knowledge, then he should not talk about religion because there are religious scholars who know everything, who have studied for 20, 15, 30 years, who knows how, or have studied all their life. Here, they know everything, so go to them. If you have a toothache, you go to a dentist, if your car breaks down, you go to a mechanic. If something else, you go to a third. In general, there are a million professions. All of them are in demand. But the thing is, religion is not a profession. Religion is like feeling hungry or thirsty, for example. No profession is needed for you to satisfy your sense of hunger or thirst. Of course, there are chefs who cook. Then go to the chef, sit next to him. He cooks. He's an expert. And if you yourself don't take what the cook has prepared and don't eat it, then being near the cook is like being near the mechanic who makes your car. Or you sit in front of a dentist with your mouth open and he climbs there. Sitting next to the cook won't help. The dentist will make your teeth. They will make your car. But you won't satisfy your hunger. So religion shouldn't be confused with a profession. 
and you shouldn't confuse religious scholars with people who can solve your problem, which is comprehending religion, understanding religion, and so on. Here, we were just talking about the cause of many, unfortunately, of these religious scholars. And these religious scholars, unfortunately, they don't say, I can't give you Islam, but they roll up their sleeves and teach you Islam and stuff you, and you think this is Islam. But in reality, what you're presented with as religious knowledge or knowledge of religion, you are satisfied only until real hunger for your Lord matures within you. If you go to the cook sitting next to him, you will not be satiated. Even if you share your food with the person closest to you, again, you will not be satiated. You have to eat it yourself. On the material plane, people do that because it's the right thing to do. If you are thirsty, you go, pour water and drink it. But for some reason, on the spiritual plane, people do just the opposite. They accept what other people tell them about Allah. One can be told about Allah for thousands of years. As Allah said in the Quran that even if all the oceans were turned into ink and all the trees into kalams, Allah's words would not run out. Human life would not be enough to tell everything. It would not mean that you have come to know Allah. So when you satisfy your hunger with food, that is right. But when you listen to a story about Allah, and Allah remains something that you have not felt in you, that is called shark. That is, you're tolerating a mediator between yourself and your Creator. It's like driving from a town of Arsk to Kazan, for example, and stopping at the exit from Arsk under a sign that says Kazan and an arrow, assuming that you have already reached Kazan. Stupid? No, no man in his right mind would do that. He would go to Kazan. Why is it that when it comes to God, we sit and listen to those who talk about God? Although they too only know about God, what they have read from books, or what their teachers have told them. Where is a practical living experience? I know one person who has such an experience in Islam, but I could name many of them. But one we all know for sure is the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. He had that experience, yes. Why don't we aspire to do the same thing? Has someone forbidden it to us? We have been forbidden. We were forbidden. I will explain how. There is an ayat in the Quran in which Allah tells how He communicates with man. Man is called there by the word Bashir. It is not given to Bashir that Allah communicates with him, otherwise than through Weya, this is revelation, hijab. This is not a woman's scarf. The Quran never uses hijab in the sense of an element of clothing. A hijab is a veil. And by sending a messenger, Rasul, it is said in the ayat that Allah inspires what it desires. And accordingly, the Rasul brings this information to people. I would like to point out that the word Bashar is used in this ayat, not insan or rajul, but Bashar. Actually, this word in Arabic language has the same root as the word butterfly. A butterfly is a wonderful creature which flutters and flutters. Let us imagine a butterfly. It flutters and flutters, and then it sees a caterpillar. And she remembers, I was the same way. The caterpillar greedily devours leaves, flies up to the caterpillar and says, Caterpillar, do you know you have a future like this? The caterpillar says, No, I don't believe you. We are very different, to put it mildly. And anyway, get out of here, I have to eat. Then a miracle happens. The caterpillar freezes for some reason. Its form changes. It turns into a chrysalis. It is effectively dead. If you open this up, what they call a chrysalis, there is a liquid protein mass. 
This caterpillar has turned into Kissel, and there are processes going on in this Kissel that would then make a such wonderful creature out of this Kissel. By the word Basher in this ayat, Allah alludes to what must actually happen to a man. So not in sun, which comes from the root forgotten, forgot his God, that's not all, nor Rajul, which is generally only upright, that is walking Rajul. Rajul is generally foot in Arabic, the walking man, he may not think. This ayat, if you read the tafsirs, find it, read the tafsirs or even just the translations. It says everywhere that in this ayat, Allah is referring to the prophets whom He addresses by sending way, that is revelations, or communicates with them through the veil, or sends Rasul. There is a bit of hitch here. The messenger is already a messenger, and then He sends a messenger to him, it turns out. How does it happen? Well, then they come out in such a way that this messenger, who is mentioned in the ayat, is the Archangel Jibril. What a perverted mind you must have, that is, how much you must be in the clutches of shaitan to come up with such things, to insert into an ayat of the Quran something that Allah did not say. For example, changing Bashar for Rasul, saying in the commentary that it is Rasul, what good fortune that the Qur'an has been preserved in the original version, and we can always go back to the original and say, you are wrong. It doesn't say Rasul, it says Bashar. That is, any ordinary person who has a potential to turn, figuratively speaking, into this butterfly, and he does not say, referring to Rasul, after Weha and Hijab, and the third is Rasul, he does not mean Archangel Jibril, because Archangel Jibril has specific names in the Qur'an. Ruhul Kudus, Ruhul Imid. Others may be named, but he is never called Rasul. No need to fudge. Who makes you do that at all? You must be very proud of yourself at the moment you make it up. Or who do you serve at all? The question occurs to me when you twist the meaning of the ayat like that. And so, if this ayat were taught correctly, then every student of a madrasa coming out of there would know that he is called a basher. In principle, something should happen to him in the spiritual plane, after which he will become a completely different being. It is in the Quran that Allah also says, Life and death, all these peripatias of life, we have created in order to turn you into something that you cannot even imagine. This too is the Quran, the same caterpillar. Here comes the butterfly. The caterpillar can't imagine it. And Allah tells us people, you can't even imagine what I'm going to turn you into, something so unbelievable. But this is a blockage here, that people are not allowed to interpret the Quran, to read and understand it themselves, that you need scholars to teach you Islam. What Islam if Islam is given by Allah? Just as Imam is also given by Allah. What you said does not mean anything yet. Allah says, did you think that you uttered the word shahadat? That is, you showed everyone that you believed, and we will not put you to test after that to shake you out of what you really are. Here, for example, Allah says in the Qur'an, I will drag you to the very bottom of hell, and I will leave you the most stubborn there on their knees. Well, you have to understand for a long time. And when I ask Muslims, who is this ayat about? They say, it is about kufar, that is, those who do not believe in Allah. I say, well, kufar do not read the Qur'an. And then the withdrawal begins, I say, here, Allah says, you all. This is predestined by your Allah, the ayah concludes. This is predestined by your Allah. What makes you think is not your concern? When Allah, to you, who read the Quran, He says, you, not them, He says, the kafirs, but you. What is wrong with you that you do not see that this is a reference to you? Because if you read namaz, do you think you won't go to hell? I asked the shakirds, the students of the Muslim madrasa, what do you read namaz for? They told me, to go to heaven. Okay, I said, there is such a hadith. But before I got to the hadith, I told them this. What would you say about a man 
who is running down the street shouting with joy and shouting. I found a key to a chest with a million dollars in it. Well, let's look at the material plane for now. Here, he comes running up to you or past you. What do you say to him? People react correctly. We'll ask, where's the trunk? I say, here's a hadith where the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, says that namaz is the keys to paradise. There is a book, Namaz is the key to paradise, by Imam Al-Ghazi. Yes, that hadith. There was such a hiccup that you could hear flies flying in the audience. Then they, these students, told me, you can't dive so deeply into hadith, meaning that the shaitan immediately, we won't deny that a man is afflicted, infected by the shaitan. Here, he turns his mind upside down so much that I would rather not see it. But why can't we see it? I will digress a little, but this is a good example. Why do we see at night that the sky is dark, even though there are trillions of stars shining and it should be bright? Why? Scientists are trying to unravel this question. There are different theories. But here's one that fits me better. It has to do with the way we are made, that our brain is engaged at 5 to 6 percent, and the rest of it is as if idle. But scientists can find what it does. And in nature, there cannot be an inactive organ. Nature always, if there is an organ, she gives it, and the brain works at 5%. And we see at night that is dark. Maybe there is something wrong in our brain that we don't see that light that floods the universe? Is it that cape, or that prism, or those glasses that Shaitan puts on us the very moment we're born? Why does the child scream? Because he is hit by Shaitan. This is also a hadith, and the child lets out his first cry. And in that moment, it strikes us, and we don't see reality as it really is. And we have to break out of the captivity, out of the suit that we are wearing. It's not Shaitan's fault, it's Allah's way, because a caterpillar has to mature to turn into cocoon. In the cocoon, the caterpillar dies. It is not there. There, a different creature is born, which will turn into a butterfly. It's roughly the same with man in the spiritual plane. I want to go back to the point of getting religious knowledge. That is, I have heard many times that you are not competent, you have no religious education, but they are religious serious scholars. If this transformation from a caterpillar to a butterfly is going on in a man, but it will happen to a butterfly in any case, but in a man, it may take a very long time. If this process goes correctly in man, then he begins to ask the right questions. He begins to look at things from a slightly different angle. Give such a person a leaf, an ordinary tree leaf, especially if he is armed with a modern scientific means on the basis of studying this leaf. He will come to the conclusion that there is a creator of all this. Today, the main argument for all skeptics, the main argument in favor of the existence of this mighty force, and Allah has different names, including Kahar, who has the greatest power, that is, indescribable power. Here, quantum physics is, I believe, just a herald running around with placards saying, there is God. If you listen to quantum physicists, they may be atheists themselves, but they also wonder. I've seen physicists, these quantum physicists, who are so passionate about what they say. And then they say, and here, I don't know what, because he is an atheist. If he knew that here, where he can't name, there is God, Allah, then he would have the whole picture of the world lined up as it should be. That is, the level of intellect. Whether you graduated from the Bauman Moscow State University or Princeton, it does not play any role. You will only be a professional in your business, but in religious aspect. You are as yet not educated, and if a person has everything right with that, then he recognizes God, and God doesn't interfere with his picture of the world. On the contrary, he explains everything. That solves many, many problems.
all Muslims say that in Islam, there is no intermediary between God and man. And this mediator is present everywhere, at every step, whether in the form of Sheikh, a Quran tafsir, or, I don't know, some illiterate loudmouth who says that if you have read a hadith, then you will go to hell if you read a Quran and understand it yourself. And indeed, the Quran is the word of Allah, addressed to every person. Of course, Allah will find a way to reveal the Quran as fully as possible to that person, according to how spiritual mature he is for one or the other. Now imagine the magnitude of the crime committed by those who say one should read tafsirs. Tafsirs were written by men. These men were far from sinless. If even the Prophet Muhammad is in the Quran two or three times, Allah, I, I, for some wrong actions, they are, it is preserved in the Quran. Yes, that is. Allah corrected what he did wrong. If the Prophet Muhammad had, as our enemy, so to speak, criticized, here he came up with the Quran himself. He would not have left such things about himself in the Quran that shows his weaknesses. That is far from an angel, but nevertheless, it had been preserved in the Quran. And those who wrote the tafsirs, were they cooler than the Prophet Muhammad? Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Were they sinless? It turns out that they think so. If people feel that way, that's their problem. Hence the problems they find themselves in as a civilization as a whole. The Muslims should be given a big F for not building a creative society more than a thousand years ago with such an arsenal of means, such deep faith, and such opportunities to reach the truth. They had. It shone during the life of the Prophet, and then it all went to ruin. And that is still a mercy. Bakarat was so strong that Islam left the great ethics, the ethical doctrine. Even the fact that we study Islam in our families, it gives us such great ethical potential, how to just behave properly as human beings. According to the same hadith, for example, that until you love for your loved ones the same things that you love for yourself, your faith is imperfect, and so on. If, for example, you see an obstacle lying in the road, the first sign of Imam is, mind you, not but what you have removed. You may not even say these words, but your inner decency is such that you see, there lies a log on the road. You have removed it. This is the first sign of Imam, according to the Hadith. When I was talking to a very high-ranking Muslim figure, I brought up this Hadith. He told me that this applies only to roads where Muslims walk. And I told him, but if both Muslims and non-Muslims walk there, will you remove the lock when Muslims walk? Do you understand what happened to a man to come to such an understanding of Islam? That I only do good to Muslims. By the way, a wonderful lesson in Islam was taught to me in my time by four Muslims who were visiting our country. I was their interpreter. They were from England. When I saw them off, they were leaving. They saw that old woman sitting there, who didn't have enough money to live on, were selling whatever they had. And I was still so hot back then. And they gave me money and say, do them business. They don't even need it. They just see the needy sitting there. I said, they're not Muslims. I also decided not to remove the lock there, and they told me. What difference does it make? They're human beings. That was a very strong lesson for me, a lesson of what a Muslim should be. Thank God that Islam has preserved at least that. In this sense, Muslims in terms of morality, morals, of course, are an example. But it can also collapse because there is too much confrontation with the shaitan system which undermines Muslims. And if you're just a Muslim and you don't have this connection with Allah, then you will go looking for a good life somewhere in that part of the world where you think the Kafirs live.
And then you will go out at demonstrations and shout that we will force you to live by Sharia. Again, the question arises, why didn't you build a Sharia state in your historic homeland? You fled from there as from hell to other prosperous, non-Islamic countries, and do you want to bring them to the same state from which you have already fled once? Again the disease, huh? Shaitan, he's like that. Shaitan is a disease. Ideally, one should strive not to be cured by death from Shaitan, because when death comes, the spirit is set free and it sees that it has messed up there all the years it has lived, as long as it has messed up. One must be united with Allah in life, but that is according to the hadith that the Prophet Muhammad said, die before you die, die before you die. I read a tafsir of this hadith, the commentary. It made me laugh. So you have to prepare a shroud. You have to prepare money to distribute their 39.50 sadokas to those who were organizing the funeral, conducting the event. That's how it's perceived. No, that's different. It's like with a butterfly, I guess. Yes, the butterfly. She has no choice. There is a clockwork mechanism going tick, 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 tick. And she goes from a caterpillar to a butterfly. Allah has given a man million lives. If you want, there is no compulsion in religion, he said. By the way, let us stop on this ayat. It is very interesting. There is an ayat in the Quran that says, there is no compulsion in religion. By the way, I once wrote an article and used this ayat, but the censor removed it. It was for an Islamic resource. The censor took it down because he thought I was not a theologian. I had no right to apply it. When he removed this ayat, the meaning of the article was completely lost. Where he was looking, I don't know. So, I have an interesting story connected to this ayat. I was teaching in a madrasa, so to speak, and somehow, I was jerked to remember this ayat, and an argument rose. And because I used this ayat to justify a thought of mine, my listeners argue so fiercely that they forgot I was even there. Some groups sprang up to argue with one another, and I watched and watched and listened, because there was a lot of information that I didn't know, but they know, they read books and everything. And then I was convinced that if Allah has given you some knowledge, you don't have to hide it. Allah says in the Quran, by the way, that He will not even approve of this, but He may impose some sanctions on a person who hides knowledge that Allah has revealed to him. And being in this audience, I got a great example that, really, if Allah has revealed something, you shouldn't be afraid, you should bring it up for discussion, and it won't suffer. If it is the truth, it will not disappear, it will not weaken, only strengthen. So, I'll go on. In the heat of this argument, the words began to be said. Do you know at all what the occasion for this ayat was sent down? The reason for sending down the ayats is a separate science in Islam, very serious and very important. And then another group started. Of course we know. The young people there, they are all hot. Everyone wants to show that they know, and then it started to fall, just like diamonds. They say, this ayah was sent down when the sons of the Sahabs, the Sahabs are the companions, the apostle of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. When their sons began to accept Christianity, somewhere in a conversation, for example, 
You wouldn't say that out loud, but here it came out. And I was like, whoa, thank you, that's enough for me. I began to delve into this topic. What happened that the sons of the Sahab, those are the associates who saw the living prophet, their sons also saw him. They may have become Sahabs later too. This is a generation that is Sahab. All those who saw prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, they're all Sahab, associates. How is it that under the living prophet, the sons of his followers embrace Christianity. You don't have to go far, there is some life experience after all. You understand what has to happen for this to happen in a family. This means that they would come and start bending their children, their sons, saying, Let's read namaz, let's do this, let's do that. And the young, especially Arabs, very hot-blooded, and there were family dramas like this. I will not obey. They were violating a very simple principle. In principle, you can't force anybody. You're not in the army. In the army, yes, you can. If you don't know how, we'll teach you. If you don't want, we will force you. That's normal for the army. But it's not the army, it's a family. And then these Sahabis, all in snot, came to complain to the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Here are our sons. What should we do? They have gone to Christianity. So you yourself created such an atmosphere that this is what their protest was about. They may not have wanted to, but they had to stake their protest. And that's when this ayah came in. And there's no compulsion in religion, Allah says. I would add in tafsir if I were writing that it was your own fault for starting to coerce. That's why you got this result. Here, by the way, there was a question that Allah will not change people's condition unless they change it themselves. What had to be done in this case? Who needed to change? Again, these fathers here, the strict fathers who wanted their children to be in the right path, practice the right religion and believe in the right God. To show an example, yes, that's it, don't. Why? Oh my God. But the history of mankind is full of such dramas and tragedies. For example, I will digress a little, but I will touch on this topic. For example, in the Quran, Allah says, believing brothers, everyone has already forgotten about it, and a thousand years ago, they forgot, when they were happily shedding each other's blood. Let me give you just one example. In Malaysia, it was a Muslim country then. It was not called Malaysia then, of course. Southeast Asia, let's say. There were sultanates there. And one day, one sultan, he was of one Muscov, and on the island lived representatives of two Muscovs, decided that everyone should be one Muscov. Again, he decided to violate the principle of no compulsion in religion. And there was a river of blood. He ordered the killing of all those who disagreed, a real religious war. Those who wanted to save their lives changed their madhab. Just a question. Here, I will return to our Tatar history. We have the Hanafi madhab, but we had contacts with the Shafi madhab. But our Imams, sheikhs, Khazrats taught their flock that you cannot give your daughters to Shafi because they make unnecessary movements during namaz, and the extra movement done during namaz disrupted, which means they are not reciting namaz. The man who issues such a fatwa must have him very proud. He must have him proud of the depth of his mind. This is why one should not give his daughters to infidels. It turns out that a Muslim who read namaz and performs some other movement according to his maskab turned out to be a non-Muslim. But this is just clownery. Is this what religion is all about? If you aim at the target and you aim it right, you will hit it, you will hit the right way. If you aim wrong, you will not hit it. Here, the Islamic world, unfortunately, did not make it. Everything according to Hadith, which says that Islam came, I talked about this already in the interview, Islam appeared in a strange way, and in a strange way will be its return. 
There is an interval when it turns out that Islam does not exist. We will wait for the return of Islam. Inshallah. You have voiced the problems that people face in getting religious knowledge. Could you say what you think people need to do to change their situation? There is a surah in the Quran where Allah says that He will not change the state of people unless they change it themselves. My prognosis, or my explanation I should say, is very unhappy. People are very passive, apathetic. It's rare that Allah chooses someone to be a prophet, for example, or a messenger. There are just some bright people you're drawn to, but basically, people are busy surviving. They have no time to think about high things, yes? Why would they change anything? Everything is fine as it is. But Allah doesn't leave people alone anyway. If you don't change inside yourself for the better, your whole life goes down the drain. That's how it works. Imagine a locomotive pulling a train up a hill. A slight rise that may not even be noticeable to the eye. The locomotive must burn fuel move with cylinders to pull, do useful work, deliver goods. It's the same with human civilization. If humanity lives idly, lives only for consumption, for pleasure, to sleep and again in a circle, this the absence of spiritual work. If we compare it to a locomotive, then for a man to be a locomotive means to work, to develop spiritually, to engage in spiritual work, spiritual construction. If you are a Muslim, we talked about the foundation. Islam has been built on this foundation. If mankind doesn't do this, the locomotive stops, it rolls backwards, and disaster is inevitable. How else can we explain this to people? Let's skip the religious terminology on our fingers. Here is an image of a locomotive. If we don't try to get out of here, out of the nightmare we're sliding into, we're going to die. What else would it take to get people to change? Let's say that a person thinks, here, you guys are gathered here, you are all people who have thought about it, who have decided to take action. That's great. And how does Allah reassure such people? He says that if a man takes one step towards me, we know it immediately comes to mind. Allah will take ten steps toward him. If you go toward him, he will run toward you. If you run toward him, he will fly toward you. That is, Allah always works ahead of you in this case once you start moving. If you imagine the same locomotive, then some incredible, supernatural power appears and helps this locomotive, and it reaches its goal. This is the same way with Allah. Look at this wonderful hadith where Allah talks about how a person can work, let's say, earn savab in plain language, earn himself pluses on the spiritual path. The meaning of this hadith is approximately the following. If a man conceived to do some nasty thing, it is in his thoughts, and he did not do it, then nothing is written down in his notebook, book of deeds. If the person has done that crap, He is given some time. It sounded like nine hours in there. I don't know. I guess that makes some sense, but nine hours for him to repent. I guess we're not talking about the so-called great sins, murder, theft, and so on, but the little things like that, which are on every step. He is given time to repent, and then nothing is written down for him. If he repents, if a person has committed a sin and has not repented, 
then one minus is written down for him. That is, even in this under zero plane of negativity, Allah tries to let a man suffer as little as possible, for he does not know what he does. And now, let's move on to people who have switched to the positive, entered a zone of positive. How does Allah treat them? If a person conceived something good, but did not perform it, didn't do it, well, didn't succeed, it is recorded for him as done. It's like an intention. Yes, there is a hadith about intention. It is recorded in the Book of Deeds as a good deed done. If a person has done a good deed, then he is recorded. There are no boundaries of these pluses. This is such a hadith. If you take it into account, people may say, what can we change? It's the whole world. Who am I? One man is not a warrior in the field. One man in the field is a warrior. We just can't imagine the potential. Even the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, for example, started out in such hellish conditions, in such a completely savage society. And look what happened. He raised it up. He actually saved it. After all, the Quran came to the Arabs not because the Arabs were good, but because they were very bad. And the Arabs themselves do not deny it. That is, Allah sent a prophet to save them. But, by the way, it turned out that this teaching is so powerful that it is able to save humanity. But we can't come and say, here's a Quran, read it. People will say, we don't need it. No, that's not the way. We have to appeal to a person's mind so that he... The idea of the creative society is just that, I think, it touches on these very points. It prompts, helps people to think and start moving. Even if you think of something good, it's a done deal. And if you have done it, imagine the power if more and more people begin to move into the zone of positivity and live a great, high noble goal. And we still need not forget that there is a concept of barza, that there is a concept of separating the sinners from the righteous. But it's all in the hands of the Lord God, and we don't know how, how it is. So again, I will return to one hadith. And if you have heard that tomorrow is the end of the world, and you're about to plant a sapling, and then a neighbor passes by and says, What are you? Come on. The end of the world has been announced tomorrow. The Prophet says, plant your sapling. What business is it of yours? Only Allah knows what will happen. Maybe this planting here is the last tree. You have been minding your own business. Maybe that will save you. And the one who was in the mood to perish, there is no compulsion in religion. Allah does not call anyone to Himself forcibly. Again, I will digress a little. Why doesn't Allah manifest such a miracle so that everyone will believe? Because He is not a tyrant or a dictator to make everyone fear Himself and convince them that He is the most important. Allah is the most loving, the most gentle. You want to move towards me, please. I gave you knowledge about me. I gave you feeling. I gave you salavat. Salavat is not only namaz. Salat is a connection, I repeat. If you have grasped this connection, then you already know where to go. If you are still in the dark, if you are still a crawling and munching caterpillar, then even you have some positive feeling. You can fall in love and experience in such a cascade of emotions to feel something wonderful and you want it to happen again. And you want it to be always. So, even in the darkest state, there is this light of God in all of us. There is a beacon, there is a landmark. But if you do not pay attention, if you are a kafir, a kafir is what? It is hiding, the one who hides a spark of God in himself. That's a kafir, not one who does not believe. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, was surrounded by believers. When Allah, even in the Quran, said, 
If you ask them who created it all, they will say, Allah created it. That is, they knew about Allah, but there were kafirs at the time. They were hiding the spark of God in themselves. But if you choose to hide it, you will have a life like that. We have now a humanity in such conditions that it is heading for a disaster. And this emphasizes that a Muslim must not only think about himself, it is time to think about all of humanity. Humanity is a single organism. And this too does not contradict the Quran. Aydar Garifutinovich, summing up our conversation today, what advice can you give to a man who seeks the truth? If we accept the truth as God, because there is no God apart from the truth, he calls himself the truth. Then I would advise not to dwell on anything except Allah himself. This begs the question, how so? What is he talking about? And he's a heretic anyway. When I voiced this hadith about how Allah communicates with man at a conference, I was told that it was a case of psychiatry, that is, I was accused of being mentally ill. This was done by a high-ranking Muslim cleric. The very idea of Allah communicating with an ordinary person is unacceptable. Shaitan has people so confused, yes? The question is, if Allah does not communicate like this, how can a man come to Allah? You can't just say hello to him. You have to establish a deeper inner spiritual relationship with him to understand that you are inseparable from him. How do you do that? Allah, in this ayat, tells us how he does it. For the common man, here's the one, we're also common on the street. The messenger comes and talks about Allah. It works on someone, someone remembers, begins to move. If that person keeps moving on this spiritual path, yes, he heard from the Prophet, we're not lucky. We did not hear from the Prophet, but we're lucky in the sense that we're much, how should I say it, more valuable to Allah, because we do not hear it from the living Prophet or from the Sahabs who saw the Prophet. We learn about Allah from the Quran from religious tradition and so on. If one keeps moving, there comes a moment when Allah begins to speak to him through what? The hijab, the veil. The veil is what? It is the world that surrounds us. Everything that happens there has always been the direct speech of Allah. We're just not capable, not in the mood to understand it. And when a person's spiritual state reaches this level, he begins to hear the speech of Allah even in ordinary sounds. Many, many. The whole world begins to speak to him. It is not for nothing that there is a story in the Quran about prophets who understood the language of animals, for example. That's not just for nothing. And finally, the highest stage of how Allah communicates with man is revelation, when Allah speaks directly into his heart. So I say, don't stop at anything until at least this way begins to sound in your heart. Otherwise, if you stop at a sign that points to the city of Kazan or any other city, you stand still, you do not move. You have erected a mediator between you and your maker. Then you're committing a shirk. Shirk, according to Quran, is not forgiven by Allah. It is not that He will whip you and burn you in the fire. No, you just stand, you don't move. That is the sin. In the Greek language, for example, the word sin means to miss. Yes, indeed, you miss, you don't hit, you don't go to the goal, you stand. So I wish you do not stop at anything but Allah, not to be satisfied with anything but Allah. And in order for that to happen, you have to keep moving. Don't stop, no matter what the whispers tell you, that you will not go to hell if you… If you do that, if you do that, if you read the Quran in translation, you will go to hell too. My God, in any language of the world, Allah can tell you things that He would not tell even the most advanced shaykh if you have the right attitude, if you seek Allah, if your thirst is so strong that you do not agree on anything except connecting with your Creator.